Bow heads, if you will. Dear Lord, as again, we come thanking you for your goodness. Thanking you for your kindness. Thanking you, Lord, because you allowed us to come out to the house of prayer one more time. We ask you, Lord, to bless our pastor this evening, Lord. Give him a word for your people, Lord. Touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, Lord. Bless him right now, Lord. Bless those that are on their way to the church, Lord. Give them a safe arrival to the building. Those that had a desire to come out this evening but are not able to come, actually bless them, Lord, and allow them the time and space to come and to hear your word and to obey it, Lord. Lord, bless each and every one of us here, Lord. Give us an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, Lord. Bless those, Lord, that don't know you and the power of the Holy Ghost. Touch hearts, touch minds, and save souls, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you right now for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness, Lord. Lord, we ask you to bless us and make us a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. At this time, can we receive, receive our pastor by saying amen? Amen. amen? All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. We apologize for our delay in starting. Amen. We're having technical difficulties. Amen. Uh, we are going to be jumping back into the series. Uh, which we were in in mid-December when I was so unceremoniously taken away from Bible study by uh, being put on second shift at work. We're glad to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. As I've gotten off of second shift. Uh, however, since it's been about two months since we were uh, into the series, we're going to have a review lesson to get us back up to the point where we were uh, when we left off. Amen. Amen. So this review lesson will cover um, the most important details of all the lessons we've had in this series thus far. This is all review. However, it's going to be my intent to not rush through it. Amen. Uh, I want to take our time and make sure uh, that we have this foundation down very well because all of the things in this lesson will be extremely important as we move forward. I didn't grab my markers. Could you grab my markers for me real quick in the eraser? Amen. All right. So, uh, we're talking about the secret key of revelation. The secret key of revelation. Uh, so, once again, this is extremely important, not just in this lesson, but in understanding the Bible at all. This, this part here is important for any lesson, and as a matter of fact, this stretches beyond Bible study. This is important in life, uh, in communication, in interacting with people, uh, in going to school, on the job, anything. Context is key. Thank you. Context is key. Context is, is defined as the circumstances that form the setting for an event. Context is the circumstances that form the con uh, excuse me, uh, form the setting for an event, for a statement or an idea. The context is the setting, and in terms of which it can be fully understood, which is to say, if you want to rightly understand anything, you must have the context for it. Amen. You must have the proper setting for it in order to interpret what is being said or what is being done. Amen, somebody? All right. Uh, this is why when you send people a text message, amen, if you're having an important conversation, a lot of times folk don't want to have that by text message. They'd rather talk to you on the phone. Why is that? Because when I talk to you on the phone, I can hear your vocal tone. I can hear your inflection. I can get a better sense of what you're saying. When I can hear your voice, it gives me more context for what is going on. Amen, somebody? Amen. All right. Uh, if, if you just get a random text from somebody, and all the text says is, they're killing me, well, what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of different things. Amen? Who's killing you? In what way are they killing you? If you get a text from your child at 11.30, says, they're killing me, you're probably going to panic and hurry up and say, why are they texting me? You're going to call them. What's going on? Where are you at? Are you okay? 
and your child might answer the phone laughing and say, yeah, I'm at this comedy show. These comedians are killing me over here. We need the context. Amen? So when people take the Bible and they take one verse of scripture and they quote it with no context, well, what does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things. This is why people say, oh, you can make the Bible mean anything you want to mean. No, you cannot. No, the Bible means what it means. You can take it to mean whatever you want to take it to mean, but that doesn't make the Bible mean what you're taking it to mean. And God is not going to judge according to your interpretation. Amen. God is judging according to what it means. And there is a meaning. Amen. So in order to rightly understand the Bible, we need the context for what is being said. Amen? So we need the cultural context. We need the literary context. We need the historical context. The, the, the historical setting. What was going on? Who was there? Amen? We need the literary context. What was said before that? What was said after that? Amen? If we don't know anything else we ought to know, that if you, if you ever find a chance to be on the news, they interview you for something, they never use the whole interview. They're going to take what's called a sound bite. They might take you saying one statement. Now, it depends on how they want to flavor the story. They can take a statement you said, and they can flip it to sound like you're saying what they're saying about the situation that happened. And then folk get mad. It happens all the time. If you don't want the media to use you, don't talk to them. Amen? Because there is no longer anything such as an unbiased media. They're going to flip it and bounce it. Amen. They're going to be liberal or they're going to be conservative. Amen? Uh, they're going to use it to, to support the idea that they are promoting with their story. Go ahead, sir. We're talking about context, Pastor. So, um, being I was raised in apostolic, that don't mean I'm better than nobody else. Y'all hear me. Um, but according to Acts 2 and 38, that's where I base what I understand being saved is. Mm -hmm. I meet a lot of people, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They say they're saved. Is there some kind of answer where you can tell me uh, what, what would it mean when you say now, see, I know what it means, according to Acts 2 and 38. Mm -hmm. But there's so many people saying they're saved, and it's not my job to say they're not. Mm -hmm. But can you be saved but not standing on Acts 2 and 38? Acts 2 and 38 is the door into salvation. So I don't, I don't ever ask people if they're saved. That's a waste of time question. Anybody believe in Jesus is going to say they're saved. Amen? And anybody been to church one time in their life, they're going to say, yeah, I'm saved. Because uh, the popular misunderstanding of Scripture is that to be saved simply means you believe in Jesus. Or, or even more widely, oh yeah, I believe in God. It might not necessarily be Jesus. I believe in a higher power. I'm saved. I don't ask that question, okay? Because I'm going to have to ask a follow-up question, so I might as well just get to the follow-up question. What I ask people is, have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Extremely specific. Amen? And, and you notice, I didn't leave off the tongues. Do you know why? Because if you ask folk, do you have the Holy Ghost? Everybody going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got the Holy Ghost. I, got the Holy Ghost. I go to church every Sunday. I got the Holy Ghost. I, I got baptized in water. I got the Holy Ghost. One time I was in church and I got happy. I got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's not the Holy Ghost. Amen. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Amen. And why am I asking that? Because at its core, that's what it means to get saved. Amen. 
Acts 2.38, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive, what? The gift of repentance and water baptism is to receive. So if, if, you, if you say you've repented, but you haven't received the Holy Ghost, now I'm going to talk to you about what repentance actually is. If you say you repented, but you refuse to be baptized, I'm going to talk to you about what repentance actually is. Because if you refuse to be baptized, you have not yet repented. Repentance means I'm going to stop being stubborn and insisting on doing things my way. I want God more than I want anything. And I'm willing to do whatever he requires. That includes going down in the water to be baptized in Jesus' name. And, and if I say, I want, I want God, I want to be saved, but no, I don't think I should need to be baptized, but you haven't repented yet because you're still trying to do it your own way. Amen? All right. Uh, got, got to give them some context. Amen. And, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to avoid now teaching a whole lesson on Romans 9 and 10. Centering on verse 10 and 9. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so I'll give you the abbreviated version that y'all have heard from me many, 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 many times. Because what's causing the confusion uh, is something else that we're going to get to in just a moment. Amen? Uh, but what's causing the confusion is not understanding what these words are in their original language and in their proper context. So Romans 10, 9, amen, uh, when they say that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Okay, but you have to have what these words mean in the Greek that they were written in, not what they mean in English. Amen? Because what that verse is really saying is if you will profess or if you will speak the same faith out of your mouth, out of your mouth that is already in your heart, you will save. Not you will be saved, you will save others. The context, Romans 9 and 10, is Paul is saying, oh, how badly I desire for my people Israel to be saved. And in Romans chapter 10, he says, and if you will confess out of your mouth the faith that's already in your heart, you will save them. Why? Because God saves by the foolishness of preaching. You got to tell somebody about the faith that's already in you. Romans 10, 9 doesn't tell you how to get saved. It tells you how to get other folks saved. You have to tell them about Jesus. But because popular Christianity is taking this verse in English, oh, I know I'm saved because I have believed in my heart and I've confessed with my mouth. Well, you can confess all day. That's not going to make anything. I confess that I am Donald Trump. I have multi-billions of dollars and I used to be president of the United States. Nope, I'm still a black man. Didn't work. I am not a billionaire. Amen. I'm not even a thousandaire. I'm a hundredaire. <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth. I'm a hundred air. Amen? And, and, and I'm on my way to whatever the Lord has for me. But confessing it with your mouth doesn't do anything to you. It does something for somebody else. The reason you got saved is because somebody preached the gospel to you and you took a hold of it by faith and by way of Acts 2.38, amen, got baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the Holy Ghost after you repented. All right. That's a pretty good detour. <laughs> no, <laughs> amen. So I hope I answered that question thoroughly enough, and now I'm going to try to move forward. Amen. So we need the context. We need the context, the settings that allow us to understand what is going on. Amen, somebody. All right. The context is the parts of a piece of writing or speech, etc., that precede and follow a word or passage and contribute to its full meaning. So once again. In order to understand Romans 10 and 9, you got to go back to Romans 9 and 1 and read all the way through Romans 9 and all the way through Romans 10 to understand Romans 10 verse 9. You understand what I'm saying? If you just take it out of context, you'll be confused and have folk run around thinking they saved because they believe that Jesus exists. They haven't turned from their sin. 
They haven't been baptized in his name according to his word. They haven't received his Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking another tongue, which is the spirit of God who comes to live inside of you to change you from the inside out. Salvation is a change. Simply believing didn't change me. Having God live inside of me to help me change is what's changing me. Amen, somebody. But I need the context to understand even what that scripture is talking about. Let alone the fact that if I want to get more context, I can go all the way back to Romans chapter 1, where Paul says he's writing to the saints in Rome. He's writing to the saved folk. And I'm not going to write a whole letter to the saved folk to tell saved folk how to get saved. Amen. But I might write to them about evangelism, tell them how to get other folks saved. Amen. All right. So we need more than just this verse. We need what came before it. We need this verse. We need what comes after it. Amen. All right. Context is a vital and necessary component of understanding. We cannot genuinely understand a person, place, thing, or event without including and acknowledging the context of their place and time and cultural surroundings. Amen. Everybody understand what we mean by context then? If you don't, if you don't got it, please raise your hand. I want to make sure we all got this. Go ahead. I'm sorry? You don't get it? Okay, so let me see if I can say it another way then. Uh, you can't understand a sentence by word, well, by one word. Amen. I need the whole sentence. Right? So if you just raised your hand and said, understand, I wouldn't have understood. Amen? I needed you to say, I don't understand. I don't give context to the word understand. So it helps me to understand what you mean when you say understand. You follow what I'm saying now? I, 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 I need all of the information. Let me say it that way. We need, we need the surrounding information to understand an idea. All right? Okay. Context is the surrounding information. All right. Prophetic language and pictures. Prophetic language and pictures. Now, these are principles to help us understand the secret key of revelation. We need the context. Amen. And now we need to have some understanding of prophetic language and pictures. Amen. Once again, this is all review. We went through this in great detail uh, last year. All right. Number one, the language of creation. Prophetic language and pictures. The language of creation. Talking about order, structure, and blessing. And language of uncreation. Disorder, destruction, and judgment. Amen. These are word pictures that are intended to communicate an idea. Amen? Amen. So when we're speaking in terms of creation, we're talking about bringing order, we're talking about bringing life, we're talking about bringing structure. God is a God of order. Let all things be done decently and in. God organizes. Amen? The enemy disorganizes. God brings structure. The enemy brings destruction. Destruction is when you remove the order. Amen? Amen. That's why I get so bothered by folk uh, who think that the church shouldn't have any structure. Uh, you shouldn't have uh, uh, you shouldn't have uh, elders and ministers and pastors and saints and deacons. There are people who believe that everybody should just do everything, but, but that's chaos. God gives structure. We see in the Old Testament, amen, he gave the family of Kohath, he gave Levites, he gave priests, he gave a high priest, amen, he gave them structure, they, they, didn't, they didn't just have Moses, but they had judges over the tribes. Amen? They had captains of thousands and captains of hundreds 
and captains of fifties that God gave them structure. He gave them order in their army. God organizes things so that they, it can function and flow. Amen? When we're talking the language of uncreation, we're talking about destruction, disorder. Amen. The kingdom of darkness. All right. So we see creation in Genesis chapter 1. Amen? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Amen? And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Amen. So we see a state of chaos in the beginning, and God begins to bring order and structure. He brings light into a world of darkness, then he divides the light from the darkness so there can be two separate things. He's giving order. He's giving structure. Amen. Then he continues throughout the next few days. Amen. He separates the land from the water. Amen. And he begins to bring out uh, fish in the sea and birds in the air and beasts on the earth. And then he makes another thing on the earth that is not a beast. And that's a human being. Separate entity. Order. Structure. Amen. These things speak of what God does, how God flows, how God moves. Amen. Then we also saw, uh, we see separation, discernment of light from dark. Separation of water from land and the heavens from the earth. And also we see the slaying or dividing of the dragon of chaos, meaning the deep in order to create order. And the order that he's bringing forth is the land. Uh, so as we read through Genesis chapter 1, we see that he pushes back the water and brings forth the dry ground, which is where humanity will live. And so from there throughout the rest of the Bible, when you read about the land, it's talking about the place that God has set for man. It's talking about a promised place. When it's talking about the sea, the sea always speaks to us of a place of chaos and death and disorder. Amen? These are the prophetic pictures that go, beyond, go behind the literal things, and I want to be, be careful to make myself clear here. I am not saying this book is an allegory. That would be what's called Gnosticism. This book is not an allegory. This book records real history. But God is so mighty that he uses real history and controls real history to teach us uh, uh, to teach us things that are spiritual in nature. Amen? All right. When we talk about uncreation, uh, we see the language of, say, for instance, Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to turn there real quick. Joel chapter 2, verse number 31. If I can get my fingers to work. Joel chapter 2, verse number 31. I'm reading in the New King James Version. This should sound very familiar to all of you. Joel 2, 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Amen. We see that being repeated also in the book of Revelation. We see that come back a few more times throughout the scripture. The sun being turned to darkness, the moon being turned to blood. This is the language of uncreation. Remember, in the fourth day, God brings forth the sun and the moon and the stars. He's bringing forth order. Amen. Uh, he calls the light day. He calls the darkness night. So for the sun to be turned back into darkness, that is disorder. For the stars to fall from the sky, that is disorder. Amen. Now, these things are not literal things happening, but this is prophetic language to imply that God is pulling down order. He's pulling down the structure of what is there. So, for example, when Israel is consistently disobedient to God, then what comes upon them is called the day of the Lord. Remembering that the, and I'm getting ahead of myself now, but the day of the Lord is not a one-time event. 
The day of the Lord is an event that has happened many times before, and there is at least one more coming. The day of the Lord is the day of God's vengeance. It is judgment day. It is when uh, mankind or a segment of mankind has reached the end of their grace, and now God comes down with the big belt, if you will. Amen? All right. So, for example, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes that are called Israel, amen, uh, they consistently went after worshiping pagan gods and disobeying uh, the word of God as was given to the scripture. They ignored the prophets. They even were killing the prophets. And so God sent Assyria, a pagan nation, to slap down Israel. They came in, conquered them, um, slaughtered many of their men, raped and pillaged their women, dragged their sons away to be slaves and dispersed them throughout the world. If you've ever heard the term, the lost tribes of Israel, that's where that term comes from. The ten tribes were scattered over the face of the earth. Now whether or not they're lost, that's a whole other Bible study. Amen. But we might come around to that some, somewhere in this too. Amen. Uh, but, but the point is that God threw them into chaos because they rejected his order. Order comes from his word. Amen. And God said, let there be light. His word brings order. His word brings structure. His word brings function. His word brings life. If you will not receive his word, then you get the opposite of his word. Amen. His word is truth. His word is wisdom. If you reject that, then you'll have lies. You'll have deception. You'll have ignorance. His word is light. So if you reject that, you'll have darkness. You'll have chaos. Amen. You end up separated from the promise. That's the language of uncreation. And we see it used uh, time and time again. Matter of fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Isaiah 13. That's our next example there, Isaiah 13. And since this is the side of the coin that will be shown more throughout this lesson, I want to make sure I drive this home. Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 13. Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 13. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord come. Remember, that's the day of God's vengeance. Amen? The day of the Lord come. Cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. Wait a minute. To lay the land desolate. Remember, the land speaks to us of the promised place. The, the term the land, even more specifically, and I think that's coming up in just a, a, a page or two here. Amen. The land speaks to us specifically of Israel. So when it says he's going to lay the land desolate, he's going to lay Israel desolate. And what does desolate mean? Desolate means empty. He's going to empty out the land. The land that he has given for you to live in, to grow your families in, that's supposed to be uh, overflowing and bustling with life, he said, I'm going to empty it out. It's going to become a ghost town. It's going to be tumbleweeds there because you're not acting right. Amen. To lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I'm going to remove your order. Your government's going to fail. Your law enforcement's going to collapse. Amen? Uh, the corruption that is in your system is going to cause your entire system to collapse. Boy, that should concern us where we are today. Because sure enough, we're living in a very corrupt system that rejects the word of God at every turn. That, that should give us some kind of prophetic insight at, at, at to where we are in the process and what is likely to happen next. Verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, those who are full of pride. He's going to humble them. A whole lot of pride just bubbling over every June. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Haughtiness, high-mindedness. 
Thank you so such and much. Amen. Looking down your nose at everybody else. Oh, they are beneath me. You say, I'm going to lay them low. I'm going to knock them in the dirt. <laughs> Verse number 12. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold. Once again, he's saying, I'm going to lay the land desolate. I'm going to empty the land out. There will be no people in the land. Once again, the land I designed for you to fill up, to be fruitful and multiply, and grow your families who are supposed to live in the land and enjoy it. Instead, I'm going to empty the whole, I'm going to clear the whole table. Amen. You'll be able to walk through the whole land and not see nobody. Finding a person in this land will be like finding a brick of gold. It ain't happening. By the way, this did take place uh, for just about, let's see, uh, 1,000, almost 900 years. About 1,860-something years, that was the case. From the year 70 A.D. to the year 1948, the land was desolate. God is not playing. He does exactly what he says he's going to do. And Isaiah is prophesying uh, this is between five, six hundred years before Jesus is born. Isaiah is prophesying what's going to happen 40 years after Jesus comes. Amen? That's, not, that's a word of prophecy for you. It took generations for it to come, but it sure enough came. Amen? Verse 13, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth will be moved out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Now, since we have the context for when this came to pass, let us ask ourselves a question. In the year 70 AD, did the sun stop shining? Did the moon stop shining, or did it turn to blood? Did the stars literally disappear from the sky? Did the heavens themselves shake? No, this is prophetic language. This is the language of uncreation. He's saying, I set you up, and now I'm going to undo what I set up. I put you in position to be blessed. But since you don't want to walk with me, I'm going to remove you out of position. I'm going to destroy the position. Amen? Yeah, yeah. Mamas used to tell us, I brought you in this world, and I'll take you out. That's, that's what he said. Amen? I made you. I set you in the promised land which is at the center of the world's trade routes, so that you would be enriched. Jerusalem is a place, if, if, that's why uh, 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 the Muslims still want it. Jerusalem is in the middle of the trade routes going, uh, if you go by land from Africa up into Asia, Asia Minor, and around up into Europe, if you're going by land, you're going to pass through Israel. Amen? If you're coming from the Far East going up uh, Going up to Europe, you're going to pass through the Holy Land. If you're coming uh, from northern Asia, uh, and like the, the area of Russia, a lot of people don't realize Russia is in Asia, by the way. If you're coming from northern Asia and from all those stand states, Uzbekistan and all this, you know, uh, that I probably didn't just name an actual place, but you know, they all sound like that. If you're coming from up there and you're going down towards Africa, you're, you're generally going to pass through Israel. He put them in the navel of the world. He put them in the center of the earth, if you will, to enrich them. And he said, y'all don't even appreciate it. I went through all the... I, there was already people living there. And I went before your armies and destroyed these people and drove these sinners out of the land to set you up as my righteous people. But guess what? You're living more foul than the people who were already there were living. You are worse than the people I drove out to put you there. That's a rebuke from the Lord, by the way. I mean, and, and you know what makes them worse? Because those people didn't know God. He said, but you know God. You know better. You have the word. You met me at Sinai. You heard my voice when I shouted down the Ten Commandments from heaven. You saw the fire on top of the mountain. Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia, by the way, it's not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's in Arabia, that's what the scripture clearly says. Amen? You met me there. You saw me split 
The Red Sea, you walked across on dry ground. Your shoes didn't even get muddy. You know I'm the real deal. But still, you're following after the pagan deities. You don't want me. You want Baal. You want Ra. You want Zeus. You want Dagon. You want anybody but, boy, that sounds just like society today, because let me tell you something. You can be anything but a Christian, and you're just fine. They won't bother you. I mean, you can have all your crystals. Amen. You, you, you can pray to Allah. You can be, uh, you can be a Hindu. You can, you can set up all your Hindu shrines and all that. You, you say, I'm a Buddhist, and you start meditating. Won't nobody bother you. Amen. But just let folk know you're a Christian. They got challenges for you. They don't want you to talk about your faith in public. Amen. It, it's, it's a whole issue. Amen. But you know what? We have every advantage. We have every reason to be living right from. Not only, we have a greater advantage over Israel who got in trouble. You know what our greater advantage is? We don't just have the word and the histories. We have the spirit of almighty God living inside of us to help us. They had the word that told them what to do, but how to do it they couldn't find. We've got the word and we've got the author to help us. All you got to do is want to live right and try. Somebody say try. try. If you'll try, he'll help you. If you'll try, he'll help you. Now, I'm not going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about me for a second, all right? Every time I fail to do what's right, underneath all of my excuses, I didn't try. And let me tell you, I had all kinds of excuses why it wasn't my fault. But at the bottom of all those excuses, I didn't try. Whenever I try to do what's right, God helps me. And that's what it is. Amen? Almighty God wants you to do what's right, and Almighty God will help you to do what's right. But you have to want to do what's right, and you have to try to do what's right. Amen, somebody? All right. So, light is swallowed by darkness that is uncreation. That is the removal of structure. I wander way off in the left field. I'm trying to find my way back where I was at. <laughs> Amen. Light is swallowed by darkness. Water and land collide. Amen. The dragon of chaos rises. Order is destroyed. And that's the language of uncreation. I turn the sun into darkness. I turn the moon into blood. The stars will fall in the sky. Light is swallowed in darkness. Chaos. Water and land collide. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, he divided, the, he brought the dry, ground up, the dry ground up out of water, and then he gathered the land together and gathered the seas together. Amen. And so when it's all back to chaos, everything's swirling over each other. Amen. Uncreation. Chaos. The dragon of chaos rises. Now, y'all might remember me talking about this. Amen. Uh, because this is also a motif that runs through the Bible. Amen. The dragon of chaos is actually a reference to pagan religion. And if you didn't know it, because the Israelites were extremely familiar with the religion of the people around them, because mind you, throughout Israel's history, Israel was almost never faithful to God. They almost always worshipped Baal. So they knew the religion of Baal very well. So God would talk to them in the language they knew. He would use the, the language of Baal's religion to show that Baal is not God, I am. Amen? So this language about the dragon of chaos is, is actually intertwined. Once again, this is where knowing what the words are in their original language and what they mean helps you to get a, a, a deeper understanding of what's being said. Amen? Uh, so, um, for example, the story of the... Um, the Babylonian version of the story of creation uh, is called the Imuma Elish, all right? And uh, to make the long story short, uh, of course, they turned everything into a god. So you got the god of the stars and the god of the sea and the god of the sky and the god of the sun. All, you know how that goes. All, all different mythologies turn everything into a god, all right? Um, well, there was a goddess of chaos Amen. And she was threatening to destroy the order of the universe. All right. And this goddess of chaos was called, in their language, Tiamat. Guess I'll write on my board now since it's almost time to go. All right. So they called her 
Tiamat. All right. Now, Tiamat means the deep or the abyss. And in their story, their chief god that they worship, who is called Marduk, Marduk is also the one who is called Baal. He comes along and he tells the other gods, listen, she's going to destroy, oh, Tiamat, by the way, is a dragon. Tiamat is the dragon of the deep. She's the dragon of chaos, the dragon who destroys order. Marduk comes along and he says, if you will make me king of the gods, I will slay the dragon for you. All right. So long story short, they agree to make him king of the gods. He comes along, he attacks her, he splits her body in half, and he uses her head to make what is called the earth, and he uses her hinder parts to make what is called the heaven or the sky. Amen? So he destroys the dragon of chaos and creates the world. All right? So when God is giving the Torah, the, the word of God to Moses, God is correcting the hijacking of the truth. All right? And I, I think it's good I go here, too, because even though their story may, may have been written down first, just because you write it down first don't mean you wrote down the truth. Amen? The true God comes along and he says, no, let me correct what has happened here. All right? So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Or in other words, it was in a state of chaos. Amen? And darkness was brooding over the face of the deep. Okay, the deep, the deep waters, the deep watery place. Now, the Hebrew word for deep is tahom. And if you don't know, Hebrew and Chaldean are two uh, both Semitic languages that are related. So a lot of the words sound very similar. And the reason Tahom and Tihamat sound similar is because it is the same word. Darkness was fading, was brooding over the face of the deep, the abyss. Amen? So if you're talking to Babylonians, you would have said darkness was brooding over the face of Tiamat. Amen? Then God says, let there be light. All right? Now, by the way, the Babylonian version says that Marduk attacked Tiamat with lightning. All right? But God says, let there be light. He divides the light from the darkness. Amen. And then, down a little bit further, it says that he puts a firmament in the midst of the waters to divide the waters above from the waters below. The waters above he calls the heaven. And out of the waters below he calls seas. And out of the waters below he brings forth dry ground, which is called earth. Amen. So embedded in Genesis 1 is where we see God slaying the dragon of the deep, Tiamat. All right? And then we see this come back up later on in the book of Psalms and in other places where it talks about God slaying Leviathan. Leviathan is another name for Tiamat. He crushes the heads of the serpent. That is Tiamat, the dragon of the deep, the dragon of chaos. But here's what's interesting because we see the dragon show up at the very end of the book, in the book of Revelation, where it says that serpent of old, the dragon, who is the devil. Amen? So from the beginning, we already know the end of the story. God crushes the serpent. Amen? Destroys him, just like he did at the beginning, he's going to do at the end. But we see the, the story being repeated again and again as we move through the Bible. Amen. And, and I'm going to stop now. And I hope I haven't lost everybody. Y'all just looking at me. Amen. Uh, but I'll give you one more example, and then we'll stop and see if anybody has any questions before we close out today. Amen. Uh, the, the other example I want to give you, and it's a major one, because it's almost like the reset of the story. Noah's flood. What happened? Well, the people began to uh, interact with fallen angels in such a way that women give birth to giants. Amen. Half fallen angel, half humans. 
persons, amen, and this takes over the face of the earth where the whole earth is covered in bloodshed, and God is made to despair that he'd even made man, but one man named Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and the Bible says Noah was perfect in his generations, and the word generations there means he was undefiled uh, by the serpent seed. You know, he, was a still, he was still a pure human being, and uh, therefore it was necessary to have a pure human being in order to fulfill the plan of bringing forth Jesus, because Jesus cannot be born through a demonic bloodline. He's got to be born through a purely human one. Amen. So Noah is found who is perfect in his generations. Amen. He's a man who loves God. He go, uh, God gives him to build the boat. He builds the boat. And then God brings the day of the Lord on this unrepentant ancient world. And how does he do it? Water and land once again collide. The fountains of the deep burst open, which means water rushed up out of the earth. Amen. The windows of heaven were open. Water rushed down from the sky, drowned the whole thing. Only those who were in the ark lived. Amen. Side note, the Bible says eight souls were saved. At least hundreds of thousands of animals were on there, but eight souls were saved, which means souls is a reference to human beings, which we can prove by a whole nother, but that's just a short answer for that. All right. Uh, so at any rate, the whole world is once again covered in the waters of the abyss. It's a reset. The whole world is now the deep. And no one in his family cannot come out of the ark until the water recedes and the dry ground once again appears like it did in Genesis chapter 1. Amen? And when God brings man out on the other side of the flood, God has once again conquered the chaos and now man begins to build once again with order and with structure until God blesses us and once again we forget God and have to be destroyed again. Amen. So the cycle continues. Amen. Um, nonetheless, so these are just a few of the things about prophetic language and pictures. All right. So uh, if the Lord says the same, we're going to pick up next week on slide number four where we will continue talking about prophetic language and pictures. Any last comments, questions, or thoughts? If so, please go to the microphone. Is it wise to uh, look up the book of Enoch? Because you were talking about Noah and the giant, and I hear a lot of people referencing that in the book of Enoch. Is it wise for us to even research that book? All right, here are my thoughts on the book of Enoch. Um, I own a copy of it. I've read it several times. Um, trying to figure out how to give my the short version of what I think about it. Okay, I'll start with the Bible, okay? The book of Enoch is referred to in the New Testament as prophecy. Prophecy only comes by God. So in the New Testament, it's basically saying the book of Enoch is the word of God. It's referred to as prophecy. Then it is quoted as scripture in scripture. It's quoted by both Peter and and I believe Jude, both quote from the book of Enoch. Me having read it through several times, I found nothing in there that contradicts what we have in the scripture, but I do find things that enlighten us to what's happening in the scripture. So, um, I think it's okay for you to study it. Do I personally believe it belongs in the scripture? I think it probably does. And I know that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they actually have the, the book of Enoch in their Bible. Amen. Um, can you get along without it? Yeah. Amen. We, we can make it with the 66 we got here. But if you want to take a look at it to see if you can get some further understanding of what's happening in here, that, that's also fine. So, and that's the answer I'll give. Go ahead, sir. So, my uh, very illustrious pastor, Okay, you said it's not popular. That's one thing that's really not popular around is being a Christian. Mm -hmm. So what is it, whereas, you know, your pastor or your church, not this one, thank the Lord, you, you can get an abortion if you want to. You can marry a man if you want to. In that church, they are growing. So are they Christians? Well, they're certainly taking off and growing. 15,000 members, one church in Atlanta, and he was only open for two years. Now he got 15,000. He, sh 
he, she, she. I'm going to say, he, she. He got 15,000, 15, 1,500 of them. In two, in two years, he grew his church. And, uh, and are they Christians? Or what, how do I refer to them? I was talking to my son the other day, and, and uh, he can hear this. And my son, he, he married a man, so he, he ain't shamed, so I ain't shamed. He lives in Atlanta. So uh, what, what do we refer to that? Are they Christian? Okay. Um, what is Christian is defined by Acts 2.38. The first word in that is repent. So we have to turn away from our sin and turn to obey God. Whatever he wants is what we are willing to give him. That's what repentance is. Amen. So if you are blatantly living in a lifestyle that is against what the word of God says, then that is definitively not Christian. Growth does not make you a Christian and growth does not make you a church. Just because you put a sign out front that says C-H-U-R-C-H on it, that doesn't make you a church. Amen? The Holy Ghost has to be there. Just like I'm not a Christian, if the Holy Ghost is not in me, I'm not saved. If the Holy Ghost is not in the people in the gathering, then the gathering is not a church. Because a whole lot of folk can, grow, can, can draw several thousands of people. Amen? Uh, I, I believe WrestleMania 3 at at the Pontiac Silverdome, supposedly had 91,000 people in attendance. That don't make them a church. That's just a whole lot of folk in one place agreeing with each other. Amen? And, and, and on the other side of that, uh, you can have a real church that only got two, three members meeting in the storefront, meeting in somebody's living room, and, and be way more real than the mega church, you know, with, with 40,000 members, and all kind of ministries and private jets and the pastor got a Bentley and all of that, you know, that don't none of that stuff mean you a church. And that's not to say a oh, mega church can't be a real church. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not against mega churches as long as they're really saved. Amen. Just like I'm not against small churches as long as they're really saved. I'm against anybody claiming to be this that ain't this. Because they're making us look bad. Amen. Go ahead, sir. In essence, in essence to minister there, a uh, Christian is to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And Romans say, he who has not the spirit of Christ is not a heel. Yes, sir. That's in your Bible, unless Amen. you look through it out. Yes, sir. Now, he who has not the spirit of Christ is not a heel. Now, if you got Christ's spirit, which means you belong to him, mm -hmm. you act like him, you walk like him. If you have not his spirit, then can, can, can I just go back home? I'm a country boy, and a pig is known to wallow in mud. Now, you can take him out of the mud, but that's not going to stop him from being a pig. Mm -hmm. You can clean him up, put him on a suit on, a tie, put him on stetson on his head, mm -hmm. some uh, uh, the most expensive shoes you can go get on his feet. He's still going to be a pig. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when the scripture said, he who has not... His spirit is not his. You can, you can clean up a person, but if they don't have his spirit, they can call themselves Christians all day long. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have his spirit, then they're not, they, they're not his. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that's, that's just as plain as the nose on your face. They're not his. Amen. And a lot, of, a lot of what causes this confusion is folks think that if you just once again, if you just believe in Jesus, that means you're a Christian. And then also, the way of the world now says that you, more or less, all you got to do is claim to be something, and you are that. So even though I was born male, I got hair on my chest, and man, I, I've got extra equipment hanging between my legs. But if I say I feel like I'm a woman, now y'all got to call me a woman. Well, I can claim to be anything, but that don't make me what I said I was. Amen? I'm male because God made me male. My chromosomes say X, Y. 
I, I can cut it off. I can put makeup on it. I can put a wig on it. Amen. I can take some hormones and grow some breasts. But you can't change my chromosomes. Amen. And you, you can't be a Christian just by claiming to be. You can't be a Christian just by going to church. You can't be a Christian just by believing in Jesus. You've got to receive salvation. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We've got to be changed from the inside out. It's, it's his Holy Spirit that makes our spirit holy. Without that, you can be a believer, but you're not a Christian. Go ahead, sir. This is crazy. You know, my, my love mind be racing because, you know, I really want to know. Um, and I looked at, I looked at this as uh, the Bible say be fruitful and multiply. And how can two men multiply? How can two women <laughs> multiply? Can it? They're working on it, but I, I think that's what, what they're trying to do now is trying to put the two of the same together so they can't multiply. But can't nobody stop that but God because these women, these African women, is still having babies. Mm. Mm. I tell you what, I told my daughter, I told my daughter when she was little, if you want to get electricity, you got to put a plug into an outlet. You can't get electricity from two plugs. And you can't get electricity from two outlets. Just common sense. Amen, somebody? All right. And, and that being said, listen, we all have uh, same-sex family members. That by this time, I'm sure we all got somebody in our family. Amen. And uh, God loves them just like he loves you. And we call to love them just like we love anybody else. Amen. Uh, members of my family, I don't treat them any differently than I did before they became or came out or whatever. Amen. I treat them just the same as always, and I love them just the same. Amen. Uh, but they know better to ask me about what I think about it because they know where I stand. Amen. Uh, but that doesn't change how I treat them. And I, and I hope they don't treat how they feel about me because they're not going to change my mind. I believe in the word. Amen? Amen. But, but I want to be clear about that. Because even though we stand against all forms of sin, wherever we might find it, but we stand in favor of people. But people have to come out of all forms of sin, no matter what form it is. That includes homosexuality. Amen? All right, any last comments, questions, or thoughts? All right, well, we thank everybody for being here on this evening. Amen. The Lord says the same once again. We will pick up where we left off next week, tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. Amen. We will be having our virtual prayer meeting, which is hosted by Bishop and Prophet Haywood. Amen. Only on Facebook Live. We hope that you will join us online as we call out to the name of the Lord together. Amen. How many of you know prayer changes things? Show up. Show up. Amen. So we're going to pray. We're going to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. Uh, and then on Sunday, we'll be back at 9 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school here in the sanctuary and 1030 a.m. worship. All right, please stand along with us for the benediction. We're grateful to those of you who are able to join us by Facebook Live today. And it is our prayer that you'll hit the share button so that those who are on your timeline can also share in this Bible study experience. Father, right now, we thank you once again for allowing us to gather together in your name. God, we ask you to let your word penetrate our hearts. Oh, God, help us to come into complete compliance with your word. Let your spirit be stirred in us that we might think the right thoughts and speak the right words and take the right actions, that your name might continue to be glorified. Teach us how to love ourselves. Teach us how to love one another that your love might be made manifest in the world. For all these things we thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.